tomatoes. Nothing like the taste of the sudden ripened tomato. This is actually the Cherokee purple here. An excellent heirloom tomato, the Cherokee purple. Now the, this is from my own garden. I recognize the uh, little cage that I have there. So you can see they're pretty productive. Now, perfect for your first tomato sandwich. This little saucer is about uh, five and a half inches across. So you can see it's a pretty good sized tomato. There are many, many heirloom varieties. You have the good, the bad, the ugly. And you can see they're ugly in, in depending on your view, but that ugliness sometimes makes them the best tomato. Uh, some examples are the Nepal Mortgage Lifter, uh, Brandywine, Lillian's Yellow, and Black Creme. I've grown the Mortgage Lifter, Brandywine, the Black Creme, and the Cherokee Purple. Uh, the, the thing about heirlooms, they all have a story behind them. Do you guys know the story of the mortgage lifter? So during the Depression, there was this uh, gardener in West Virginia, and um, he was worried about losing his house. So he thought, well, if I could sell these tomatoes, I could pay my mortgage off. And in fact, that's exactly what he did. He grew these tomatoes that he labeled mortgage lifter and was able to keep his house during the more the uh, depression how about that now an heirloom versus a hybrid i'm very interested in heirlooms um so i've you know done a lot of research on them but there is nothing wrong with a hybrid except perhaps the flavor now the heirloom is defined as one that has history seed that has been saved and passed down through the generations, they have a story behind them. They are open pollinated. In other words, they're not pollinated uh, by brush in a greenhouse somewhere. They are in the open air. Uh, tomatoes actually self-pollinate. So just a little shake on them is enough or just the movement of the air. Thing about open pollinated tomatoes is they come back true to form. I could save those seeds and um, they will, I could say them grow them next year and I will have the exact same tomatoes. That is not true of hybrids. If you save the seeds of a hybrid and uh, plant them the next year, you won't necessarily get that same tomato. You might, but unlikely. Uh, it'll go back to its two parents. If before 1940, it's not a hybrid, a hybrid has been crossbred for variety, production, and disease resistance. Uh, back after 1940, you know, everything got really high production, uh, industrialization is really uh, occurring, and they wanted to be able to ship tomatoes across the country. So they started breeding them to be able to do that. And in those days, people wanted a smooth, round, a uniform tomato. So that's what they were going for. And farmers wanted disease resistance. So as a result, you lost flavor. Are there new heirlooms? Well, not all open poll uh, pollinated tomatoes are considered heirlooms. Uh, that can still happen in a field. You, know, you could have uh, two tomatoes in your garden, two varieties and uh, they can be pollinated, perhaps by accidentally pollinated by a bee. If the bees get there before uh, the tomato has a chance to pollinate itself, um, then it becomes an open pollinated, but still by a bee instead of by the tomato itself. A true heirloom has a story, has history. So not the new ones. Okay, hybrids now have been crossbred for better tomatoes, not necessarily flavors. You get better production, many different varieties, and they are more disease resistant. For example, if you see F1, uh, that indicates it's a first generation that was bred to fight uh, fusarium. V2 indicates it's a second generation, it's a uh, verticillium resistance. Both of those are diseases. Now, the um, 
Marnero, I've just discovered this, is a Cherokee purple heirloom that was bred with a stronger rootstock. When you have a stronger rootstock, that uh, not only makes it a uh, more vigorous plant, you have a bigger root system, but also it provides more disease resistance. So the Cherokee purple is now available as a hybrid. And maybe that's not so bad. Um, this year, I'm going to grow this tomato along with the heirloom Cherokee purple. They say the Marnero has the flavor of a Cherokee purple. So I will get back to you on that if you're interested in knowing. Also, Garden Treasure is a 2021 proven winner. You know that brand proven winner where they you know, have contests. This was selected. It is also a hybrid um, heirloom. So this is new. These are actually heirloom tomatoes that have been paired with a um, strong root stock. So it'll be interesting. Um, now I used to be able to tell people that look on the back of your seed packets so you could uh, find out if it has disease resistance for your hybrids. I, don't, I find that's no longer true. So when you shop for tomatoes, what you want to do is just look on yourself and look at tomato up and see what it's resistance to. Okay, different types of tomatoes. Um, indetermined is one that we all are probably familiar with. It vines, grows, and produces until frost. It's the most commonly grown uh, vining type is what you want to remember here. Determinant is just bred to grow to a certain size and number, uh, then it halts production. There always will be shorter and bushier. That, therefore, it's called a bush or a patio tomato. This tomato is particularly good if you're canning. I don't know how many of us do that anymore, but it, if you grow like uh, five or 10 of these at one time, and then you'll get this mass production, and then you have all the tomatoes you need for canning. Now, a uh, sort of a new type is the dwarf and vigorous determinant. Both of these stay small, but they keep producing. I've grown uh, the dwarf tomato, and I find the dwarf tomato does stay small, but the uh, tomatoes are smaller. You usually find these on cherry tomatoes. There is now a vigorous determinant. And uh, some of you may know the celebrity tomato. That's what that is. It grows bigger than a drawer, uh, a little bit bigger than a bush. And um, it's called a vigorous because it'll keep producing longer than a bush. So that's kind of a good tomato to grow if you don't have a lot of space. Here's an example of what they look like. Uh, just compare the two, the uh, indeterminate with the determinate. Okay, see that heavy production coming on. But uh, once that's done, it's done. In the garden, this is our historic learning uh, garden here. The big in indeterminates in the back and the bush type in front. Uh, little little uh, packs where they have like six to 12 to a pack. Take them home, separate them, pot them up. You all know how to do that. And uh, take care of them until the plant sell. And you can take like a $4 investment and turn it into, you know, $24. Uh, one thing I'll say about the big box stores, this last year I noticed they used row cover when it got chilly at night. They were actually doing that, so that was good. Okay, don't buy this. These are fully grown uh, determinant or bush type tomatoes. This, um, these plants, they're over and done in a very short time. Give yourself the satisfaction of growing your own. You are a gardener, so use your skills, okay? Don't buy these. They're, you know, you're gonna put them out and in a couple of weeks it's over. So it's great for canning. It gets a lot of produce at one time. You can't get no satisfaction from this tomato because you know, you're not growing it yourself. All right, check your label. Note whether they are indeterminate, determinate, or dwarf. The only, 
Now, I've tried a lot of dwarf, the little zebras, and you'll see those in the ovid shape. You'll find them in the drawer. They can be any of these types, but they can also be the grape, uh, cherry, ovid, zebra, beefsteak, plum, paste, etc. Many, many varieties. They can be heirloom or hybrid. Check for disease resistant. You're only going to find that on the hybrids. However, the, the heirlooms do have this, sort of an innate disease resistance. So don't think they don't have, have that. Uh, remember that celebrity is a vigorous determinant if, if you decide to go that path. Okay, um, uh, we always start with a soil sample like every three years from Virginia Tech. In between, I have a little thing that tells us and it's pretty accurate. You can get your uh, pH on that. And uh, Virginia Tech, of course, is very good. They'll tell you exactly uh, what you need to do. Ours always at the garden always says, don't add lime, you're, you're too sweet. And that's because we use compost and compost is known to be more alkaline than acid. But uh, normally uh, what you're gonna do is add um, compost to a well-prepared soil bed and add any amendments that your soil test indicates. You want to plant those tomatoes deep, 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 sideways even. I know it's hard to do that because you've got this plant and you want as much exposed, but that's not what you want to do. You want to cut off those uh, lower little uh, branches. If the cotyledons are still there, just clip those off. And uh, I'll show you a picture in a minute how to do sideways. Add a fourth cup of lime to the bottom to work in. Why lime? Even though our garden uh, is more alkaline, tomatoes need the lime to fight uh, blossom end rot. It's the only way that you're going to conquer that. And you can work that in any time, but better to start at the beginning. Cut off those lower stems. What you want to do is to prevent soil borne disease. If you're planting in a container, use a mix of compost and potting soil or a soilless mix. If you get that, you're going to have to watch your fertilization. Mulch heavily at the base with landscape fabric, straw, or both. Okay, cannot mulch too much. Okay, if you're planting uh, sideways, deep and sideways, that is pretty limber in there. You have to be a little careful. But if you do this, you're going to get root here and you're going to get roots all along the stem. Roots give you a strong plant and they'll have uh, more disease resistance because that's what their job is. Okay, Keep it a little bit shallow in here so that the water can settle when you get to the watering stage. Now, support systems. Um, the uh, stakes are very simple, very inexpensive. They're good for bush plants. Um, don't injure your plant's roots. I always put the stake in first and then the plant. Uh, the, if you use stakes, you're going to have to limit uh, your tomato plant to two stems uh, because that's all it's going to support. Tie your plant to the stick loosely to allow growth. Now, I like cages. Cages are very effective. They're initially expensive, but well worth it. Get the heavy duty only. You think, well, they take up a lot of room, but actually the new ones collapse very flat. So it's not an issue at all, storing those in your garage or under the house, whatever. Trellising is relatively new for me, anyhow. Uh, we uh, tried that uh, last year at our garden and it worked very well. To start, the, I'll show you a picture, but a T-post string trellis, you get really good airflow, helps avoid airborne disease. Works well if you're single stemming and the suckers are controlled. They're very, it's very productive, keeps plants off the ground and away from soil borne disease. We're going to talk a lot about that. Okay, this is a picture of our garden, and you can see here's the stake. And um, as I said, it's it's probably will topple as this tomato gets bigger, so I don't favor that too much. The cages, um, 
very effective. The plant grows right up in there. You have to have these wide open so you can get your hands in there to harvest your tomatoes. Another example, note underneath, landscape fabric, straw. This is still not enough. We need to keep adding to that. And over here, um, the trellis. I hope this part isn't showing. And you can see the trellis system over here. See how the stream comes down? The tomato actually will go, grow up here. And if you look closely, you can see these little clips here and there. That's what uh, supports, the, it doesn't really support it, but it guides the tomato. The tomato will vine right up there. And that uh, should be held to two stems. Another view, the cage, cages, and a different uh, trellis system, but still, the stream coming down from above, it's not really attached. It's just got the little clips holding it. Okay, now as that tomato grows, you want to pinch out the suckers. I'll show you a picture of a, a sucker, but it's in between the main stem and another stem or the axle there that comes out. If you don't control those, your just your growth is just going to be out of control. So pinch pinch out a lot of it, not necessarily all. Limit your plant to two stems on a steak tomato. How do you do that? Because you know the tomato has one stem. So choose a sucker um, from the the bottom of the tomato and let that grow and be your second stem and get rid of the rest. Your plants will topple over from the weight if you don't. The suckers are small shoots here. I just explained that to you. You want to also you can replant a few of those suckers to ensure a late season tomatoes. Just pinch that off, and you can actually put it directly into the soil. Um, and if you're uncertain that, you can just put put a few of those in water, and they will root readily, and then you can plant them. Either way will work. It is not necessary to prune or cut out too many suckers on caged tomatoes, as that cage will support a lot of vining growth and provide shade for your tomatoes in the hot months of July and August. Don't prune back on determinate or bush types at all. You need all of that foliage for the type of growth that you get there. Okay, so see here's your main stem coming up. And another one, uh, this is actually um, a sucker that I've allowed to grow. And this is a sucker. You want to get rid of that one. Okay, just pinch it out. If they're small, they're easy to pinch out just with your fingers. Uh, but you can use, if, if they get too big, use a little pair of scissors. Uh, you can also uh, prune out the top. If you have, are using cages, when that tomato gets up to the top uh, of your cage, uh, just go ahead and pinch, prune this out, or pinch it out. I'd cut that out because it's pretty good. So. And that'll stop the top growth, okay? All right, now what are the problems that we have here in Virginia, our section of Virginia? We have uh, heat and humidity. There's just nothing worse in July and August than the humidity. I've exaggerated this, but still, you get, get the idea. Hot, humid, wet climate. Okay, the winters here are not cold enough to kill disease that lives in the soil. That's the biggest problem, you know. I used to think tomatoes are so easy to grow. Well, it's not so easy. Tomatoes have to fight off a lot of blight and fungus. Um, and that's what, whoops, sorry. Um, try, so buy tomatoes that are disease resistant. Look for lots of letters if you're buying hybrids. Heirlooms will not have those, but they have that natural resistance. F stands for fusarium, uh, uh, V verticillium. This is the second generation. Race three is like a variant, like our COVID now that are popping up. Um, as the tomato, you know, grows, it'll develop other issues, and that's what that stands for. So the more numbers you have, the better if you're looking to buy hybrids. Uh, PM powdery mildew, that means it's resistance to that. Uh, TOMV, to 
tobacco mosaic. Just don't smoke. None of us smoke. I know that. I think that. I hope that. Uh, but the problem is the people who raise the tomatoes might be smoking around them. So that's, that could be an issue. All right. This is your worst nightmare here. Uh, you think, what can I do? Can this tomato be saved? This tomato could have been saved maybe early on. Now, I don't know. This is early blight. And you can see by the tomatoes, those tomatoes are, you know, in their productive season. So this is not early in the season. Early blight can happen any time, uh, not just uh, when we put them in. So uh, at this point, you're going to remove this affected foliage. But what you really want to do is uh, prevent this. Make sure you have mulch to prevent uh, soils, uh, disease splash up from soil borne disease. So what you have, you must practice good sanitation, you know. Uh, don't use your uh, clippers on one tomato and go to another before cleaning. Clean hands, containers, and tools. Um, this is, could be brought into the garden by infected transplants that you fall in the soil and seed. Then you need to understand that once you have tomatoes growing, if you have any disease process, uh, that's going to stay in the soil for years. So your goal is to prevent that disease from moving up into your tomatoes. How do you do that? Two ways, the mulch and watering. You do never water overhead. You water at the bottom. And I suggest that you don't even water with sprinkler head. You know, just take that nozzle off and just have that soft water at the base of it. Okay, other diseases are the verticillium wilt, early blight. This, this is what it looks like in the beginning. Fusarium. A lot of times that will be right up, come up right up uh, one side of it. That's pretty distinctive there. Late blight, you will see a lot of this. That's the, the folds in the beginning. And septoria leaf spot, that's easy to identify. It has that little bolt bull shot effect there the, and the halo around the outside of that spot. Also bacterial spot. It looks a lot like this, but without that uh, yellow halo. So, you know, you can take these to your, um, you know, the help desk or extension, but you know, it's, it's too late. You, you've got to prevent this. And I agree with Marty, the Piedmont Master Gardeners, you all should be on that site, PiedmontMasterGardeners.org. Please read that, uh, subscribe to it. They have a publication called The Garden Shed, which every month they put out a newsletter on what's going on with the vegetable garden. And it has, all, it has a lot of information. It's very, it's very well written, something that we probably should strive to do. Okay, other problems, blossom end rot and cat face. Uh, just use that line, uh, work that into your uh, soil as you're planting your thing, and you won't have this. If you see this on your tomatoes later, just toss in some more lines and that will go away. Cat face, I should have had that turned the other way. You can see why it's called cat face. But uh, this is planted in cool temperatures, and you could put it out and have a few cool nights and that will cause that, but that won't continue either once it warms up. Okay. This is what happens when you plant your tomatoes too soon. These were planted mid-April. That's too soon. Dead, 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 dead. Okay. Frost destroyed tomatoes. What this person should have done is gone out and covered this with row cover, and uh, they would have survived, maybe. The last frost date in the peninsula area can be as late as early May. Safe date is still Mother's Day. Try row cover and uh, for protection and remember that's what causes your cat face when you see that. All right, now I'm going to go over this but I'm also going to repeat this several times because it's very important. We're talking about prevention because once you get the disease, you know, it's over. Uh, blight and fungus are soil borne. So water at the base of the plant, never, never overhead. 
avoid splashing up on the plant because once that infected soil splashes up on your tomato, you know, it's, it's gonna be bad. Uh, keep the lower stems off the ground, prune to at least eight inches. So if you do get splashed, like you don't know, get rains and you're not protected, um, keep it up at least eight inches and hopefully it won't splash up that, that, that high. Use that heavy layer of, of mulch, straw. Uh, grass is good if it's untreated. Plastic um, and the landscape fabric I like because it lets the uh, rain coming in on watering come in. Water regularly so that the tomato can absorb calcium from the lime. So you have the lime down there, but if you don't water it on a regular basis, um, it's not going to be able to absorb it in a timely manner so you can still get it. Um, tomatoes don't need a lot of water. Uh, really twice a week is enough for tomatoes unless it gets really, really hot. Leave space for air circulation. That's very, very important. I try to stagger mine instead of, you know, real tight together. So, um, you know, just stagger is what you want to do there. Don't plant in the same space as last year. That's why it's good to have a little map of your garden in case you don't remember. Or a safer thing is to use containers with a soilless mix or potting soil and compost. That way you can be assured that there is no disease. Uh, containers are not, I don't find, as productive as growing in, in directly in the soil. However, uh, one of the books that I use called Epic Tomatoes, Greg Lahoye, I forget how I pronounce it, but anyhow, he grows all his tomatoes in bags or containers. And uh, he has like 150 and it works very well for him. How to fight once again. Water regularly for a healthy plant. Uh, it will end that loss of inlet. You can use an organic copper sulfide, as long as it's organic. You don't wanna use bad chemical sprays. You can try baking soda spray that helps keep the plant from absorbing fungus. Try serenade. Um, our fellow master gardener, uh, Justin Diaz, put me onto this. As, we, as you know, he's a great vegetable gardener. It's an OMRI approved biofungicide. That's organic materials reduced. So it's been approved to use organically, serenade. Uh, the problem is you have to use that pretty frequently, like every seven days. So I use a, a spray pumper and it kind of mist it out. You're going to get the foliage above and below the tomato. Use a fertilizer heavy in phosphorus, not nitrogen. Nitrogen is going to give you too much foliage and this will feed your tomato. That's what it wants. This is so important. Remove the garden debris at the end of the season. Don't leave those have diseased uh, tomatoes or any, get them out of the garden and don't put them in your compost if they're diseased. All right. Once again, be proactive and organic. The mustard plant is recognized to be a natural fungicide. So uh, start a crop in early spring so it can be dug under before you plant your tomatoes. Now, I heard about this at the uh, Master Garden College. Uh, Barbara Pleasant gave a presentation and she said she planted, just sowed uh, mustard seed, not uh, transplant, just put the seed in and it grows like crazy. Um, and then dig it under when it gets, you know, about three or four inches. Leave it in the ground, uh, the roots and the foliage. If that bothers you, be sure and just leave the roots and just plant around that. That will kill the fungicide, she says. Now, we're going to try that this year for the first time in my garden, so I'll get back to you on that. Good. Allow for good air circulation. Plant them three feet apart. If you're in a raised bed situation like we are, that's hard to do, but do your best and try to control your growth. Remember that tomatoes are pollinated by air movement. Rotate. Uh, plant your tomatoes in a different spot. Uh, from last year or plant in a clean bleached 
container. If it's an old container, bleach it out. Get any disease out there. Use that soilless mix or potting soil and compost. Use heavy, heavy layers of mulch material underneath. Pinch off those lower branches. Water from the bottom, not overhead. You can use neem oil. Uh, that's good for uh, insects and uh, disease too, really. Insecticidal soap and baking soda may help. Okay, I did put in some mustard uh, just in late fall just to see how it would do. And th this is good. This is right at the size, uh, size that you would like to chop it in. You don't want to let it go to seed because then your whole area is going to be covered with mustard plants all over the place. And I'm not a mustard eater, but I just, I couldn't throw this away. So I used a lot of it in salads and on a sandwich. It's like arugula. It gives a nice little zingy taste to your sandwich. I like that. Here is a good example of uh, cutting off those lower branches. See how well she's done that? I and mean, look how good her tomatoes look here. So that's a good example. She could use more mulch down there. That's the only thing I would say. And I wouldn't plant peppers uh, next to a tomato plant. These are our uh, uh, little containers that we have. Serenade, approved for organic gardening. This is a concentrate. You probably can buy it in a spray, but this is fairly expensive, as I remember. But just mix it up. Uh, try to mix it up fresh as much as you can. Insects, another big problem. There's the old tomato hornworm. I found this on my tomatoes. I have a hard time finding them because, you know, they camouflage themselves. So what you have to do is look for bare stems uh, where your foliage has uh, been eaten away. And if you start seeing little black pellets, those are fecal pellets, all over the place, that's your hornworm. So you want to remove him from the garden because um, he will literally eat that plant uh, alive. We really watch out for him. Now, if he has the eggs on top, you know, from the parasitic wasp, yeah, it's okay to leave them because that wasp is a beneficial for the garden. However, I am not willing to sacrifice my foliage. So I take him off and I don't kill him, but I put him outside the garden. And you can do what you like, but that's what I would do. I would, you know, three and a half to four inches long, that guy is. Other insects, slugs, you know, you use that dish of beer, spider mites, trips, white flies, aphids. Uh, use your neem oil and soapy water spray. Japanese beetles, I go around with a little bucket of soapy water and just, you can't pick them off. I don't know why I put that in, but you can knock them off into that water because they're very fast, they move around. Cut worms, use half of a toilet paper holder around the stem when you plant them. I haven't seen cut worms in our gardens. I haven't seen nematodes in our garden. Now, listening to all this, you probably think, are tomatoes really worth it for all this work? Yes, they are. And so I want you to do that. Okay, another bad guy, that brown marmorated stink bug. You, every single one of you know what the stink bug looks like. I know that. So get rid of him. I knock him off into the soapy water. You want to seek and destroy him. You can tell that you have him because you'll see these small punctures and the small white hard spots on the surface of the tomatoes, then start looking for it, okay? A good thing that you can do is to practice companion planting. Uh, tomatoes thrive, uh, I didn't know this, but particularly around carrots. Uh, tomatoes and uh, love carrots. So the other thing are uh, marigolds. These are not French marigolds. Uh, really, you want that flat surface marigolds. It's better for pollinators and it will bring the right, it'll ward away the bad insects is really what this one will do. And basil, basil is great for your tomatoes and with your tomatoes. You want to avoid planting with other nightshade veggies like eggplant, never, never put eggplant with tomatoes and peppers. Uh, potatoes, 
please don't buy that plant where they have the tomatoes on top and potatoes on bottom. That's just not right. Okay, so avoid this. Uh, you want to ward off the bad pest, encourage the good pest. Now, companion gardening. This is our garden. Uh, and we have decided that we're going to have not only a, a monarch way station, but we're also going to practice companion planting in our garden. So around the border, we have established this. This is in the beginning of the season. See, our plants are, aren't really taking off just yet. But look, as the season goes along, we have uh, wonderful uh, plants there that will help our garden. This was begun by Barbara Gustafson, our old leader, and now Bev Baker is heading that up with Helen as her uh, helper. And uh, Kim, Kim and I do a lot of the vegetable gardening there. And here is the fruition of our companion planting. Well, if you stop by the garden during the plant sale in May, we won't be this far along, but you'll see that we're pretty well established there. We're very proud of our garden. Okay, please, please do not let your tomatoes rot on the vine. Ask a fellow gardener or a neighbor to harvest for you if you are unable to maintain your plot or your plants. If you let them rot on the vine, you are inviting uh, insects, birds, and critter damage. And that means you're not a good neighbor. If you do that, you're gonna lose all those great tomatoes. Harvest when they're green or just as the tomato is ripening. Take them home to ripen, particularly if they're about three fourths of the way there. And in August, when you know, in September, when they're coming to an end, you have worked too hard to waste the fruits of your labor. Consider donating to a food bank if you have too much. We do that. We have dedicated beds that go into fish. Uh, who has who nicely gave us uh, that space for our garden. You want to, then you can quick roast them in olive oil, garlic, freeze those tomatoes for mid-January treat. This is my favorite thing to do. These are San Marzano tomatoes. They're not a full-size tomato. They're bigger than a grape tomato. I put down olive oil, slice those up with some slippers and garlic, roast them for 20 minutes. And I like them over angel hair pasta with some fresh basil mixed in. There's just not much better than that. Okay, any questions? Uh, Mar um, Bill is going to, if you have a question, put it down and Bill will monitor and I'll be glad to help you with that if I can. Great job, Harriet. Oh, thank you very much. Harriet, that was excellent, and uh, really appreciate your encyclopedic knowledge. I mean, it's just, uh, <laughs> <Not really. laughs> it's just wonderful, and as you all can see, she really is such an asset to us out of the learning garden. Uh, it's just uh, so helpful uh, to have her there as a resource, and all of us continually learn from her, and uh, just really a treat. Um, um, I might suggest uh, if you have questions, I, I've been watching the chat and haven't seen any uh, show up in the, uh, in the chat. So if uh, there are people that have a few uh, questions, uh, you can put them in the chat or uh, you can unmute and ask, uh, but I try to keep it as uh, not a free for all. Um, I might also suggest that uh, this might be time for people to take a, a brief break. Please keep it brief because we have a lot to cover in the business meeting. Uh, I'm sure Marty will second that. And so if people can try to get back for the business meeting by, uh, can we make it 10.05? It's 9.56 right now. So 10.05 to convene the business meeting again. Yeah, let's, and, let's, that's, that's good. Nine minutes, 10.05. I agree, Bill. Okay. We'll start up. Very good. Yeah. And Harriet, if you don't mind, and anyone who asks questions, uh, if you can stay and uh, uh, and we'll try to get your questions answered during that break. Okay. Okay. That sounds good. And Harriet, thank you. Uh-huh. Great. Yeah. I, I, if I tried to grow seeds and had all that equipment in my laundry room, I would be divorced. <laughs> 
So that's, yeah, yeah. yeah. Actually, it's and, not that much with their transplants. Uh, yeah, well, that's what I do. Like you said, I buy the six packs and then repot them, put them in a sunny window and yeah. get them six inches yeah. tall. That, that makes the best tomato. Yeah. And wait till May to plant them. Right. You're, you're, you're right. right about that. So. So I see a couple of questions, but um, first of all, uh, eggplant, eggplant's a nightshade. You don't want to mix your nightshade plants together like tomatoes and uh, eggplant is disastrous. So, so that's why. Um, and yes, I do buy my seeds from uh, companies like I like Johnny's and uh, seeds of, what is it? Seeds of change or something and uh, seed uh, sa uh, saving sites also. Yeah, this year I'm doing, oh, I forgot to mention the garden pleasure. Oh no, I did too, the 2021, I'm growing that and the Marnero and the Heirloom Cherokee and the Nepal, but not a whole lot of them. I hope to have a few for the plant sale, but um, not too many this year because there is a limit to space. And, and Harriet Burpee, burpee you can buy the little tomato plants they send you they mail them to you and yeah. i bought yeah. three or four odd varieties yeah. last year that's true you yeah. can you can definitely do that yeah um and they're good and also you can buy grafted tomatoes i didn't even touch on that yeah. i did take a little class at master garden college on grafting so i know how to do it but to me, you know, if you're a big production farmer and you're buying those crack tomatoes, great, but, um, you know, not, not that worthwhile. Okay. And other questions, they go by so fast, I didn't see them all. How about you, Bill? Did you monitor them? Um, I'm, I'm looking at them right now. Let's see. Most of them are, are wonderful compliments for you. That's oh, for sure. You'll okay. have to go back and read them for sure. Yeah. If I hit on chat, can I see them myself? Is that what I should do? Uh, I, is, that, is that what you're doing? Uh, yes. I, uh, let's, see. let's see. Oh, here we go. Do you buy? Yes. Um, there's a question from Cheryl Rudiger about oh, yeah. uh, would you mind explaining the baking yeah. soda spray on the tomato plants? Right. Uh, the baking soda, I think, is a fourth of a cup to a gallon, Cheryl, but you can um, read the label. Yeah. yeah, you can probably look that up online, but I think that that's right. Um, I went to talk about mine. No. No crop rotation in the bottom of the holes. Yep, that all sounds good. Yeah, we don't do any, uh, oh, he doesn't do any crop rotation using the um, hillside lime in the bottom to mix his plant. Um, well, what kills the disease though? Have you ever tried this? Um, I don't know, how does that, what does that have to do with killing disease is what I don't understand. On that from Mary, Mary DeSalvo. See if you can find out Mary and let me know about that. How does, what does that have to do with killing disease, which is the number one thing you need to do. Thank you. Okay, good. Is that everybody? Oh. Yes. Yes. Oh, where did you find Serenade? I ordered that online, the Serenade from Amazon. How do you keep squirrels fencing, fencing, fencing for? Uh, I could do a whole presentation, or Bill could, on uh, keeping critters out of the garden. We have a battle with a groundhog or a woodchuck every year. You would not believe what that man has done in terms of fencing. <laughs> Birds pecking tomatoes. Pick those ripe tomatoes. And there, there's netting you can throw over those tomatoes, uh, too. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I think that's it. Okay. All right. Okay. So, uh, what is your favorite source of uh, uh, your favorite source of seeds? Uh, where do you order your seeds? Uh, 
area? Uh, different places. Um, I almost need to get up and go to my laundry room to get my seed packets, but I like Johnny's. And what is that seeds of something? Um, I forget it now. But you know who has those seeds normally is Earth Fair. Uh -huh. Yeah, they have them. And I saw them, believe it or not, at Fresh Market has some of those. It's a botanical um, a site too. Seeds of change, seeds of change. That's how uh -huh. I love that company. And uh, the new garden treasure, you can only get that through uh, prove, the proven winter sites. Okay, very good. And Burpee, and a couple of them. I just had a hard time finding, but those really, and Johnny's, I like Johnny's a lot too. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Uh -huh. Okay. <laughs> That's funny. Oh, very good. Harriet, I was just giving a brief uh, advertisement for the learning garden. Yes. Uh, again, inviting people to come out on May 1st and yes. uh, yeah. take the tour like you had invited them. Right. We won't have a lot in the garden. Um, our mustard will be gone by then. It will be dug under. So really, so we're trying different um, experiments this year. The mustard is a big deal. I've not grown tomatoes in containers at the garden before. I have on my deck. Uh, and I'm going to use... Uh, bleach clean containers and uh, potting soil and compost. I'm going to do that um, and give that a try. And that'll be in a totally different uh, environment. And I'm going to compare the heirloom with the hybrid Cherokee purple in the Marnero. I'm excited to do that. Sounds very good. Yeah. Well, Harriet, thanks again for yeah. a wonderful presentation and for taking our questions. You're, you're a delight and we, are, are, we yeah. appreciate you being a continued resource for us. Thank you. Uh -huh.